Podcasters, go do football because the first half is over in 90 minutes. Then you get like orange slices and then you're out of there an hour and a half later. So, no, I mean, we're on a headset for eight hours tomorrow night. So I would tell aspiring broadcasters to, to buckle up and get ready. But uh, as Brian Stan, my longtime broadcast partner, would always say, it's an open book test. You might as well show up with some damn notes. So I have more notes than I know what to do with right now. Um, but, you know, I'll wake up tomorrow and I'll look at my cards. I'll see who I'm light on and uh, maybe do a little bit of last minute preparation. But uh, tonight's going to be a bear. I mean, I probably won't stop banging keys until like 2 o'clock in the morning. But uh, this is the devil I know, baby. Also, I guess for people that want to feel your shoes some days, I mean, how do you balance the energy, right? Like, I mean, you just said eight hours. That's, that's, that's a unique thing, right? That doesn't happen in sports broadcasting. I remember the first day I was hired, Craig Borsari, my boss said to me, you got to leave room in your register as the fights get bigger. You can't just blow it out for the first prelim of the night. That's easier said than done. I mean, you can be sure if something special happens between Trevin Jones and Mario Bautista, I got to let it rip. And if the voice is compromised or the energy is compromised, so be it. So I do try to monitor the energy a little bit early on, but and I often find in a three-man booth, there may be fights where I'm asked to do a little bit more. I try to feel out my analysts, and I feel like if their energy starts to wane, i got to be there to pick them up. But uh, nothing, nothing can condition you for this exercise in play-by-play -play other than actually going through it. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a long one, but I know you love the sport. I know you love the story. So these three title fights, right, each of them so interesting, I think, because there are, there's such a unique dynamic between all three of them. Is there one of the stories of the title fights that, that speaks to you more than the other? Well, I said this morning, and some of you were within earshot, every time Amanda Nunes fights, every time Khabib Nurmagomedov fights, they are putting their legacy as a greatest of all time type on the line. So anytime Amanda fights, there's always a lot of pressure on her. You can argue Megan Anderson is fighting to save a division. I don't know the inner workings of that, but there's pressure on both sides. And then the untalked about part is that Israel Adesanya is 20 and 0 as he moves up to light heavyweight, right? So the timing, people are wondering about the timing and, and why is Izzy sort of biting off this challenge now? Um, but he's putting a 20 and 0 record on the line. That's a very big deal to me. And of course, the title fight everybody's talking about. Sterling Yan is a pick em fight, getting two-way action here in Vegas. So uh, you saw the intensity at the, uh, at the stare down a few minutes ago. So uh, thankfully, this card held together. Championship triple headers are a rare, a rare thing. Last week for me, there is so much attention on the top three fights. I think the other 12 aren't really getting much love at all. So is there one fight or one fighter, a, you know, a storyline, a, a nugget that you unearthed in your research? I mean, something that you're most kind of like anticipating or, or think people should be paying attention to? Well, in a lot of respects, it's moving night in the flyweight division and in the bantamweight division. So I would certainly keep an eye on those two weight classes. But it's hard for me to go in any other direction with this question other than Dominic Cruz, because I've probably spent more time with him than any man or woman on this roster. So I know him acutely. I know him intimately. I know the challenges that he had in coming back in a championship setting back in May. And it, it seems as though he was able to put in the requisite work this time around. Doesn't mean it's going to produce the desired result, but it seems like his body held up. His speed is there. Was a little bit of a tough weight cut, but uh, I'm excited to see what he can do. Casey Kenny's the favorite and I think deserves that distinction. So Maybe a cop-out answer, Johnny, but the featured prelim is the one that jumps off the card for me. Uh, right here. Uh, you know what I'm going to ask you. What do you make of Jan being the underdog as the defending champ? He hasn't, like looking at his past few fights, it seems like fans expected his opponent to win, like Rockhold, Jacare, Dom. They wanted to make a name off him. Jan is once again the underdog, even though he is the defending champ. Yeah, I didn't know which Jan you were talking about. Looks like Piotr Jan might actually close as the underdog as well. But yeah, Jan Blachowicz about a two-to-one underdog. And uh, I think the fight is properly priced, if I'm being honest. You know, I think a lot is going to be made of Israel Adesanya's size. He told us in our fighter meeting that he is going to go back to 185 pounds after this fight. He probably told you the same messaging. Um, but if he was to move up to 205 with finality, then he would progressively put on muscle and maybe would walk in there at 215 or 220. I think Jan Bohovic might have more ways to win. So if you're looking at him from an underdog perspective in that way, he's got a lot of ways to win. And I think if he is able to take Izzy down, we're going to get a real lens into how the fight could play out early on. Can he take Izzy down? Can he keep him there? Is he able to really outmuscle him on the ground as he thinks he'll be able to do? So uh, a lot of interesting layers. But if you were looking at me, for me to stand up here and say I think that, you know, Bohovic is a live underdog or deserves more respect from odds makers and betters, I, I wouldn't say that. I think the fight is properly priced.
mentioned the Bantamweight fight. That, those odds have flipped back and forth pretty much all week. Now you said Jan probably, gonna, or the defending champ, going to be an underdog too. Can you remember a time when Bantamweight was this competitive, considering we've had historically such a dominant championship with Cruz, Dillashaw, and then Cejudo giving up the belt? It's a good question, and if you look at the top 15 at 135 pounds, might be my favorite division. I think it is our deepest division if you look at the top 20 at 135 pounds on paper. I do think there's a little bit of recency bias with Aljamain Sterling because of the nature of his win over Corey Sandhagen, even though it was so long ago, it was such a monumental result that I think it still resonates. I guess my concern on the Sterling side as a better would be, you're talking about 88 seconds of fight time in the last 20 months. So uh, I know the Hayes in the barn, he's put in a lot of great work with a lot of great training partners, but uh, not a lot of octagon time in the last couple of years for Aljo. So I think that bears watching. And finally, I think outside of Amanda, uh, Islam Makachev is the biggest betting favorite. He hasn't fought in a long time. Drew's obviously been active. So how much are you looking forward to the lightweight fight, too? Can't wait to see what Dober can do with the opportunity. And for Islam Makachev, I know the number 14 is the one next to his name, but I think he is ubiquitously regarded in this sport as a top five guy. And I know Drew Dober feels like the opportunity that is in front of him is not just fighting the number 14 guy in the world. So I know Daniel Cormier is not the only one who thinks Makachev is a future UFC champion. But Drew Dober should not be plus 380 against any man at 155 pounds in the world right now. Look at his current form. He's been building methodically to this moment. So uh, I think there's value on Drew Dober. And, uh, you know, Islam always getting that respect from betters and, and odds makers alike. Right here, John, to your left. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Um, yeah, Fight Island kind of get the, got the the press and the headlines during the pandemic for you know uh, you know being very helpful to the UFC, but the UFC apex where we are right now has been crucial to the UFC. What what are the advantages for you uh, from a, a broadcast perspective of being here at the apex? That's a good question. They're minimal. I mean, I guess it's an easier navigation to go to the bathroom, but I would always pre prepare to have 25,000 people in this building. But yeah, I mean, I think coming here, it feels like I'm coming to the UFC headquarters. I know exactly where my bosses are. So it's Groundhog Day in terms of the COVID testing and going through the routine. But uh, we're used to it now. But uh, I don't know, man. I look forward to getting back to the big arenas, if I'm being honest. And some of the some of the bells and whistles and the new control room and the new studio, um, how helpful is that for, for your job to have that stuff? Isn't it amazing that we have this facility, right? Thank goodness we have this facility and are ready to go with all of these live events. I've only been in the new studio once, but a whole lot of bells and whistles there. Reminded me a little bit of actually our old studio at Fox back in the day. So I'm excited to, uh, to be here. I still wish I lived here, as many people know. But uh, I'm just so thankful that we have the staff we do in this facility because, uh, I don't know, we'd be scrambling trying to figure out where to put these things. So uh, it's good to be here, man. Thanks, John. Thank you. John, over here. Uh, John, when you obviously with commentating, it's also part of the job, not just, you know, what's going on, but the storylines going in. When you have these kinds of fights, you know, you've got Jan Blahovich, you know, obviously respect him, but we know Israel Adesanya wins. It sets up this world of possibilities of big fights that people are excited about. As the commentator, how do you balance making sure you're getting, giving both of their guys the love in real time? Well, I think that's always our initiative is to try to play it even-handedly and to try to give both guys as much credit a as humanly possible. You know, Jan Bohovic is the incumbent. He's going to be the last guy to make the walk here tonight, so you can be sure that uh, that he's going to get all of that respect and then some on the broadcast. And, you know, he has visions beyond Adesanya, too. I mean, it just so happens that his first title defense is coming against a guy who has vaulted to superstardom and is all the rage with all sorts of different people and all sorts of different walks of life. But Jan Bohovic wants to be in the UFC Hall of Fame, and he ain't going to get there if he doesn't beat Israel Adesanya. So that's one motivated man with a lot more than power. He's got a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt he can lean on too. So uh, you can be sure we're going to dive head first and give Jan Bohovic his due. I mean, I married into a Polish family. I'm going to put the Polish guy over. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, finally, you talked about it. This is a lot of fights. You've got to pace yourself. What are some of the things that people may not know that you do? Do you drink a special tea during fight night? Is there something, you know, you try to keep your word count low? Tell us some of the tricks to make sure you're still good by the time Jan Blahovich walks out there. You guys are giving me a lot of added anxiety, reminding me that uh, we have 30 athletes who are going to make the walk. But uh, there is some pacing that goes into that. 
I don't drink too much during the broadcast because I may not get a break to go to the bathroom. You know, I drink water, coffee, tea, a little bit, just sipping it here and there. But there's adrenaline that sort of plays into it, thank God. You know, so I do think that uh, the results sometimes can help your energy and be a performance enhancer. We had seven straight decisions to close the show last week. And even though some of those fights were great, uh, that's certainly not doing anything to help your adrenaline and your energy. So uh, hopefully we get some finishes, man.